Hey there, um, I want to talk a little bit about resolution and how it impacts the images that we make as x-ray technologists. And I want to kind of break it down into two different sections, two different ways of thinking about uh, resolution. First off, we're going to talk about spatial resolution versus contrast resolution. So that's kind of two big picture items that we'll be talking about. But then we're going to find that there's yet another way that we can break resolution down. So what we're talking about when we talk about resolution is just the question, can I see tiny stuff, right? And these types of phantoms are helpful for looking at that tiny stuff. Uh, so if we're looking at spatial resolution, we're oftentimes looking at these little line pairs, the little tiny lines at the center of this phantom. And if we're looking at contrast resolution, we're looking at these gradual shifts from white to through gray to black in these small circles around the outside of the phantom. So spatial resolution is just asking the question, can I see tiny high contrast stuff? So here's an example um, from CT uh, where we might measure it again uh, using the CT phantom looking at the line pairs at the center. But in here is a CT scan of uh, uh, facial bones. And we're looking at this little tiny metal sliver here at the center. Can we see that little tiny high contrast metal sliver? We know it's high contrast because it has a high atomic Z number in comparison to the soft tissue structure that it's embedded in. Versus something like contrast resolution, we're asking the question, can I see tiny differences in attenuation? So we look at, again, the CT phantom over here on the left, and we see these tiny shifts in attenuation values as we look at these small circles that are on the outside of the phantom. If we're looking at an x-ray image, I found this case study interesting. Um, what we see here is a surgical scrub that was a surgical sponge, rather, that was left in the patient. Um, and we do a soft tissue next study. So in this case, what we do is we turn down the KVP um, in order to enhance the uh, contrast on this image. And we'll be talking more about that here in just a minute. So, but to kind of break this down even further, let's talk about uh, spatial resolution in particular. And when we're talking about spatial resolution, what we'll find, and this is something that kind of had a big aha moment on this, there's actually two different ways to talk about spatial resolution now, which wasn't necessarily the case um, you know, a few years back when we talked about film, or we didn't talk about it to the same degree. We can talk about spatial resolution from the standpoint of the image, the two, in terms of image production. We can also talk about spatial resolution in terms of the image receptor. Now, spatial resolution has a bunch of different ways that we might talk about it. We might talk about it as high contrast resolution, going back to the metal fragment. It's a high contrast object, it's very small. We might also refer to it as sharpness, and sharpness isn't actually a measurable term, but we sometimes compare it versus unsharpness or penumbra, and these are actually measurable geometrical things. Um, and they oftentimes are under the umbrella of what we call focal spot blur. So let's talk about that from the standpoint of the X-ray tube. So within the X-ray tube, what we're talking about when we talk about spatial resolution is concerning beam geometry. And when I talk about beam geometry, I mean, what are those um, parts of the imaging system that interact to form certain geometrical differences? Like, for example, what is the focal spot size? That's what the abbreviation SFSS means, focal spot size on the anode. The area, the actual real space area where the um, x-rays are being produced. Or sometimes we might talk about the effective focal spot size. Um, we use an anode angle to reduce the actual focal spot size to a smaller effective focal spot size. And ideally, what we would want to work with would be a point source of radiation, but we can't do that apart from using things like radioisotopes, which we don't necessarily want to mess with. Other geometrical considerations are the distance from that source where the x-rays are being produced on the anode to the image receptor there at the bottom of this illustration. That's often called a SID or source to image receptor distance. And it can be broken down into two smaller components that we'll look at here in just a moment. But first off, let's talk about focal spot size in terms of its relationship to spatial resolution. As we increase the focal spot size, we will see a decrease in spatial resolution. So ideally, we want to use the smallest focal spot size possible. Now, the limitation that we run into with x-ray imaging is that the x-ray tube can actually burn up or the filament can burn up if we use too hot of a technique on a very small focal spot size.
Source damage, uh, let's just say SID, not SSD, but the SID is broken down into the SOD plus the OID. So the source to object distance plus the object to image receptor distance is what we have in the SID. So as we increase the SID, we have an increase in spatial resolution. As we increase the SOD, we also see an increase in spatial resolution. But with the OID, the OID, we see an inverse relationship as it increases, spatial resolution decreases. We start to get more blur. This is because of this a formula here, which is a calculation of penumbra, which is the amount of basically shadow that's cast from the object. We can multiply the focal spot size times that object damage receptor uh, distance and divide it by the sod in order to find the actual size of the shadow that's being projected from an object. Well, let's talk about it now from the viewpoint of the image receptor. Spatial resolution from the viewpoint of the image receptor is a totally different concept. It has to do largely with the matrix size. And when I say matrix size, I'm talking about binary numbers. So, for example, this matrix here on the left has very large pixels. It's a two by two matrix, meaning two, by two to the power of one times two to the power of one. And so we have a total of four little pixels there. And the pixel just means a picture element versus this other matrix here. It's considered a larger matrix, even though um, the area or the field of view that they're covering is roughly the same, but it's a larger matrix because it's two to the power of two. So it's a four times four matrix. Therefore, the pixels are smaller. And one of the ways that we measure that in terms of spatial resolution is this pixel pitch, which is the distance from one pixel to the next. So when we talk about matrices and their impact on spatial resolution, we're talking about as we increase pixel size, we are decreasing spatial resolution. And as we increase the matrix size, since pixel size is decreasing, we're increasing spatial resolution. Now, what does this mean? Well, we're talking about what is the spatial frequency of objects that we can record on a system. So that's what SF stands for, spatial frequency. Another way of thinking about that would be just how tiny can an object get and we still can appreciate its difference from another high contrast object. So this is looking at closely that phantom that we had earlier with those line pairs. That's what we have illustrated below here, line pairs. A line pair includes the line and the absence of a line. So in this case, a black line and a white line make up one line pair. The distance between the distance or the number of line pairs that we're able to see um, over a given area of time is an increased spatial frequency. So as the line pairs increase, spatial frequency increases, therefore spatial resolution must also increase if we're able to see an actual difference from one line pair to the next. So we have a way of calculating that. We can say one over two times the pixel size will tell us what the actual spatial frequency of the system is that we're working with. And this is somewhat related to the Nyquist theorem. Well, let's now zoom in a little bit on contrast resolution and look at it from these two different points of view. So when we talk about contrast resolution, again, going back to the CT phantom, what we're talking about are the little circles on the outside of the phantom and how they shift in their through a grayscale to a series of blacks. And this looks again different from the image production side versus the digital imaging side. So in terms of what's happening with the x-ray tube to produce contrast, it's largely related to what we call KVP. And so if we have a high penetrability of the x-ray beam, we expect all the x-rays to pass through our patient, which would be the case of this person on the far left. If all the x-ray passed through the patient, we would have very low contrast. Conversely, a half value layer indicates that whatever the attenuator was, it stopped half of the x-rays that we were being that we were producing. This is a most accurate way of measuring the penetrability of an x-ray beam. Finally, in terms of contrast, if we decrease the KVP, we expect more and more of the photons to be absorbed by the patient. So fewer and fewer photons would pass through the patient. And this would give us a very high contrast image. So in terms of KVP, this is one of the most difficult concepts oftentimes for students to discuss. And I've made separate videos about just this concept. As KVP increases, contrast resolution or contrast overall is decreasing. 
It's an inverse relationship, in other words. Now, there's other things that are within the domain of image production, or at least as is specified by the registry. Um, they have to do largely with grids and collimation. Grid ratio, as it increases, we expect to see contrast increase. And as collimation increases, as we decrease the area that we're imaging, we're reducing the amount of scatter, and so we would expect to see contrast improve as well. Both of these things have to do with scatter and scatter cleanup. So even though it may not be accurate to say they're happening with the X, within the X-ray tube, they definitely relate to image production. Well, let's talk about it now, um, contrast from the standpoint of the image receptor. From the standpoint of the image receptor, um, contrast has a lot to do with what we call bit depth. So here I've drawn two four by four matrices. They're both the same matrix size, but they have differing bit depths. And so you can see this is still in binary, and so it's indicated by a 2 to the power of something. The matrix on the left has a bit depth of 4. It can receive four different shades of gray. Versus the matrix on the right has a bit depth of 9. That's 2 to the power of 9. It can receive oh, close to 512 different shades of gray. So the matrix on the right has much more potential for recording all the different levels of contrast that we're receiving from objects. So bit depth, as it increases, we would expect to see an increase in contrast resolution. Now I need to be really careful here. This is not an actual increase in contrast. We would be talking about image contrast, and it would depend on how we window and level the image that we're seeing on the monitor. But allowing for an increased bit depth does give us that much more latitude for receiving images and for also displaying them and for windowing and leveling accordingly. This is clearly a complex concept and I will make some separate videos about it, but a lot of this is expressed by what we call the modulation transfer function. That's what, stands, that's what MTF stands for, a modulation transfer function. As a modulation transfer function increases, the contrast resolution of a system increases, and we largely measure this looking at spatial frequency. Now, you might say, wait a minute, I thought spatial frequency was related to um, spatial resolution. It is, but again, going back to that concept of penumbra, as we start to see more and more shading, we're starting to lose that high contrast that we need to look at line pairs per millimeter. So in terms of these two systems, system B has the bi higher contrast ratio or higher um, modulation transfer function. Well, thank you all so much for listening to this presentation. Um, I look forward to your comments. Please ask me any questions about this material. I would encourage you to subscribe and share as well. Bye.